So welcome to the March author conversation for the 2019-2020 marginal syllabus. This project convenes and sustains equity conversations in the margins of text online using the digital annotation tool hypothesis. I'm Joe Dillon from the Denver Writing Project. I teach humanities to seniors at Gateway High School in Aurora, Colorado, and I'll be your host for this conversation. We've got a terrific panel here to discuss this month's reading, which is titled Untold Stories, Cultivating Consequential Writing with a Black Male Student Through a Critical Approach to Metaphor by Sakina Everett. So before we get started, I'd just like to ask our guests to briefly introduce themselves. Hi, um, I'm Sakina Everett. I am currently an assistant professor of language and literacy education at the University of Georgia. And my name is Andrea Zellner, and I work for Oakland Schools, which is an intermediate school district here in Oakland County, Michigan. Hi, I'm Anna Smith. I'm currently assistant professor at Illinois State University. And greetings all. My name is Ramey Collier. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Denver and one of the co-facilitators of Marginal Syllabus. So we're so thankful to have you all and we're all excited to discuss um, Sakina's piece. And so maybe before we jump into that conversation, I'd like to ask Sakina to please provide us any background you have about the writing of this piece or anything you think is important for people to know about it. Sure. Um... Well, I started um, doing this work um, when I was in graduate school, and it, it is definitely a, a labor of love. Um, I started my career really as a um, middle school English language arts um, teacher, and um, after being in the classroom for a couple of years, I transitioned into teacher education and um, for me part of that transition involved developing uh, tools um, for fellow English educators and so um, I have always been like really curious about like different ways that I might teach metaphor um, in my own um, ELA classroom um, and like I said I started out working with middle school students um, while I was working through um, my PhD I was working with high school students and I just really wanted to essentially write for the old me and also connect with like current teachers in the classroom and so um, I wanted to like just kind of find like creative and cool ways to engage with metaphor and that's kind of how this project came into being. And so I was working with some high school students. Um, they were uh, part of this academic enrichment program, which was um, connected to a university. And um, the students who participated in this program, they were all high achieving students um, from various uh, schools in the Midwest. And um, they were just super excited about like teaching and learning and they all um, were interested in pursuing careers in education as well. And so for me, um, as a teacher educator and a ELA educator, I was like, oh man, this is like a great opportunity to like try to see, you know, getting young, really young future teachers <laughs> um, involved in um, the ELA, you know, process, um, the teaching and learning process, um, particularly around this notion of metaphor. And so um, when I developed the project, um, I guess I've been working with like this group of students for like three, four years. And um, the project was really trying to figure out like how to get students to think about metaphor through these like interdisciplinary lenses and um, to deepen, deepen their understanding of metaphor beyond comparing two things with um, using like or as, right? And so without using like or as. And so um, <laughs> I wanted it to be multimodal in nature. I wanted the project to be um, interdisciplinary in nature and that's kind of how things got started a bit.
I think that's really a helpful introduction. Can you say maybe a little bit more about the, the, uh, the types of students that you were working with in this project in terms of maybe just say a little bit more about that project that the students were engaged in? Yes. Um, so the students, um, as it's I mentioned, 3 <laughs> it is indeed 3 <laughs> Um, the, stu <laughs> the students, um, were <laughs> interested in, um, future careers in education and the university, um, was interested in supporting, um, more students of color, um, to matriculate to the university, which was a predominantly white institution. And, um, the vast majority of the students were um, Black and Latinx students from various um, urban and suburban communities in the Midwest. And so um, the students who participated in this program, it was a residential program on site at the university. They were there for four weeks. And um, while they were participating in this program, they took um, different classes, um, whether it was in like ACT prep, uh, writing development, um, which is what I taught. Um, they had like a lesson planning class. Um, they had classes that prompted them to think about uh, critical issues in social justice. Um, and so they were having kind of like this almost pre-college experience um, as they were transitioning between junior and senior year in high school. And so I had the, you know, luxury and privilege to participate um, as their teacher during the summer program um, in the writing class. And then um, after the writing program ended in that four week um, program, um, I, I had an interest in working with the um, black male students. Um, and so I contacted them and asked for their permission to um, engage in like an ethnographic case study with them to follow them throughout the school year. Uh, so I spent a, a year following them, um, meeting their friends, family, um, visiting their schools. And um, it really created this really interesting, um, <laughs> sorry, there's like construction going on all of a sudden. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> it, it created this um, really like fun way of getting to know them both in this academic space um, because I met them in the summer program, but then like as I followed them back to their neighborhoods and communities, I was able to gain more context and understanding for their writing that they did in the summer program. And I was able to do like, you know, follow up interviews and, um, you know, just kind of follow their journeys as they um, were transitioning to college. And so it was, um, it was a really powerful experience to be able to kind of tie it all back in. And for me as a researcher, it was, um, it really um, helped me to better understand the necessity for like engaging in these long-term projects as opposed to like shorter projects that, you know, are just like a few days or something like that because I didn't know what I didn't understand until. I, I didn't know like what I didn't know until I spent these extended amounts of time with the young people and, you know, seeing how they engaged with their families and friends and administrators and stuff like that. And so it helped me to become a learner in a new way. Um, and I, I believe, you know, doing this work also helped me to become a better teacher. Sure. Well, that's fascinating insight into the article. And I think it goes, and your description of the program goes, I think, much deeper than the article itself. So that would be really helpful for folks who are watching. And uh, so, and I think it, you've also kind of previewed why we're so excited and, and thankful to be able to talk to you about it. Um, but before we do, I'd like to ask Ramey just to very quickly explain what the heck we think we're doing here in terms of marginal syllabus and what, what brings us together. 
Well, I, I hope we're doing something that is that is productive and meaningful because I think it's worth noting that this is the second time in the history of marginal syllabus that we've had the honor of, of partnering with and working alongside Sakina Everett. And so I just want to thank on behalf of the whole project again, Sakina Yu, in joining us as a partner author. Um, you know, it's been two years since we first connected with you and your, your colleagues, um, April and Raven, and we read in the spring of 2017 a piece that you wrote um, about Black Lives Matter and media bias and very kind of practical suggestions for crafting literacy curriculum. And that was such a rich discussion two years ago. And so here we have the honor of revisiting your recent scholarship with a piece that as Joe mentioned, I'm just so thrilled to discuss. Um, but as we, before, before we do that, I'll just again briefly mention that for folks who are watching or listening um, to this uh, webinar and are learning about marginal syllabus for the first time, I'll briefly mention that since 2016, we've been cultivating conversations um, about pressing necessary and important issues of educational equity and doing so in public ways. Um, we primarily organize those public conversations, one, through these types of webinars, but also through digitally annotated texts that live online. And so in addition to this webinar being available for people to watch or listen to, um, a open access copy of Sakina's article, Untold Stories, will be available for people to read and to also publicly annotate as we have a conversation about her work. And that just leads me to note um, a few other just quick points, which is that the name of the project Marginal Syllabus embraces kind of multiple interpretations of, of the term marginal in terms of opening up marginal discursive spaces online, of engaging with perspectives that are really a kind of counter narrative to educational equity, and creating alternative forms of professional learning that are relevant to all types of educators and all types of professional positions. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I'm just going to really sit back and listen and, and hopefully contribute a little bit, but really just kind of soak up the wisdom of, of the readers that we've, we've uh, been joined with today, with Sakina, uh, and all of the knowledge um, that she's brought to this and the piece that she shared with us. Um, so just thank you so much, everyone, for joining us um, on our discussion today. Thank you, and thank you, Marginal Syllabus, for having me, not once but twice. Um, it's definitely a very humbling honor, and, you know, the, um, the work that uh, I did with uh, Dr. April Baker-Bell and Dr. Raven jones Stambro, like, that work is, you know, so near and dear, and just, you know, I could not have, I mean, they really took the charge on that and allowed me to, you know, be a part of that. And it was, it was wonderful. And so to be here again and to speak about this project is also, you know, just a wonderful opportunity that I'm very appreciative of. And, you know, when you're, you know, doing this work, you just never know when and where and how it is reaching people. And so to have an opportunity to engage in this work through marginal syllabus, um, it's definitely appreciated. So thank you. Awesome. So yeah, it, it, it's our pleasure. And uh, so at this point, let's just open the conversation up to uh, to whatever the readers want to discuss. And that can be questions for Sakina or conversations, you know, between readers are fine also for Sakina to listen to and jump into as she, she wants. So who'd like to share notes? I know we all have marked up versions of the article here. So we can as do I. <laughs> yep. Feel free to jump in. Yes. So, I have a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about this idea of consequential writing and like where it came from. You you talk you name it in the piece, uh, but I wondered I wanted to hear more about that, hear you talk about that. Yeah. Um so I guess for me, the consequential writing um, piece really is something that was like born from the students, if you will, um, because they, they helped me to understand the impact of the writing process on their learning, and they were also teaching at the same time. So um, I don't believe in like mindless projects and just like busy work and so forth. And so um, 
I wanted to create a space that was very um, useful and consequential for their uh, learning. Um, and so I wanted to um, find a way to figure out like who they were as teachers and learners and to create a space for them to be able to kind of reflect on that. Um, and because I knew that I was working with Black and Latinx students, I wanted to be very intentional about making sure that they had access to different, um, different types of readings. So some of the readings that I had them to read while they participated in the course, um, some of those readings I only came across as a doctoral student. And some of those readings were really transformational for me in my learning. And I wish I had access to some of those readings when I was 16, which is how old these students were when I first met them. And so in um, you know, developing the syllabus for the course, I looked at like some of the most influential readings for me. Um, and I was like, well, how can I create a space for them to kind of read this work? And so I built in a lot of, um, you know, scaffold supports, you know, we had dictionaries and thesauruses and, you know, like we had um, little reading groups and we would, um, they wrote like um, critical reflections about each of the um, readings and they talked about like how, how um, reading um, these types of readings uh, was transformational for them. It had consequence in their life beyond the actual program, um, beyond the actual papers that they wrote. And so, um, so, you know, it just really kind of came from that. I love this idea so much because we talk a lot about authenticity uh, or having authentic opportunities that gets thrown a lot around a lot among teachers and in the dominant discourse, but I love this idea of, of it having consequence um, because it, it does need to have weight. There's like, I, it makes me think of like Thomas Newkirk, I think is the one who said it. He talks about, we do reading like and writing like activities with kids a lot. Mm -hmm. And we never give them a chance to really do hard intellectual work. And uh, just, I wanted to name the five characteristics that you, wrote about was creativity, intellectual rigor, critical consciousness, honoring humanity, which is brilliant. And I love that. <laughs> it's like so much love I have for this, these five things that I just want to put them on a postcard and mail them to every teacher I know. And then leading to action against an inequity. I think these are so important as a way to say like, this is what we mean when we talk about when people are sort of talking around authenticity because I'll hear teachers say, well, we're writing a letter to our superintendent to change a policy. And I'm like, hmm. And it's been hard to articulate that. So I was so set on fire with this idea of consequential writing. I just wanted to, I'm so fun. I get to talk. Well, to thank you for highlighting those points. I'm definitely going to be taking it. I done that. <laughs> yeah, that's, okay. that's why we're both here. It's a conversation. Yeah. All <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I think, just pulling from Sean, um, who you shared about in the in the piece, I mean, he really points that out, that difference between, I won't call it academic, because because he, he critiques that idea, right, what we do in school, <laughs> versus intellectual challenge, like actually being intellectually stimulated, being creative, being building, you know, being treated in humane ways, <laughs> and then also being to affirm as humanity. I mean, that's those those pieces yeah I, I like that idea of rethinking authenticity and one thing I think that I'm hearing and reading about in the article you know there's there's a lot of words like scaffolding reading groups feedback which have become these they're almost like cold dead standardized teaching approaches but the way that you're talking about them and the way <laughs> you're using them they're, there's they're responsive there's there's a breath of life to them they it sounds like every move in, in the writing and then the way you're talking now, like every decision you're making is coming from that collaboration between you and the young men you were working with. Um, so yeah, I, I would be interested too in, in hearing more about the decisions on the ground that you made. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, hey, well, like when did it come in? Instead of, I'm imagining that you, there might be a moment where you said, 
oh, well, why don't we do a reading group? Or <laughs> instead of like, here's the, here's the five things we're going to do for this unit and then nothing changes <laughs> from beginning to end. That's what I'm imagining. So I'd love to hear more of how that. Came. Yeah, um, I really appreciate that question because yeah, it was not that, you know, lockstep and fixed um, going into it. Um, so um, as I had mentioned, I, I worked with this uh, summer program for like four years. And so I had um, a deep understanding of like the mission of the program which again was to recruit more teachers of color um, into the College of Education and um, to provide these, you know, really uh, enrichment based, you know, teaching and learning experiences. Um, and so um, by letting the students like participate in different courses that were taught by university faculty as well as graduate students, um, having them to teach elementary students um, at a local school that was nearby. Um, you know, they were learning how to lesson plan and engage in all these like really rich things. And so for me, I had to make sure that like my teaching was up to par as well <laughs> as a teacher educator to make sure that I was modeling what I believe to be good teaching. Um, and, you know, Gloria Latson Billings talks about, well, that's just good teaching, you know. Um, and so um, in, in many ways, I wanted to, you know, embody that and, you know, mentor that, um, model that for my students. And so when I was um, developing the unit um, on metaphor, um, one thing that I said um, at the, you know, and this was my fourth summer when I actually did this particular project. And so I had worked out a lot of the kinks in prior summers. And so um, when I did this particular unit, I said, you know, okay, here are some key, you know, kind of seminal readings that I want to um, start them off with. Um, because in the four week program, I saw them 10 times. So 10 hours face to face. And I said, well, you know, that's comparable to your average ELA unit. Um, that um, middle school and high school students, um, they usually, you know, spend like six weeks, four to six weeks on a unit. And, you know, again, I entered this work or originally as an ELA educator. And so that's always going to be a part of my identity in any research that I do. And so, you know, I have my teacher, ELA teacher hat on. And I'm thinking, okay, so your average unit is four to six weeks. And I said, there were some key readings that I wanted them to have access to. And so we read those things on the front end and, you know, kind of to give them some sort of like theoretical grounding in education. And again, they were taking faculty courses by other faculty as well. And so we were all really thoughtful about like different types of, um, educational theories that we wanted to expose the students to. And so we supported one another in that regard. And um, then I said, I want to make sure that students have an opportunity to, um, one, one thing that I knew is that people were going to wonder if 16 and 17 and 18 year old students could engage with theory. Um, and so I was like, they sure will. And so they read things, you know, like Freire's um, um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, they read, you know, work from David Kirkland and um, several other um, really dope, uh, you know, literacy scholars. And so I wanted to make sure that the students knew that they were reading, you know, doctoral or university level work. And so that got them super excited. They were like, oh my gosh, we're reading doctoral level work and we, we understand it and it makes sense. And we, you know, think this is super cool. Um, and so I got energized by their energy <laughs> around teaching and learning. Um, it made me think about teacher education and my role as a teacher educator um, in this, you know, kind of rejuvenated way. Um, and that was very exciting. And so while they were reading, they're also teaching. So I got the, you know, chance to observe them. And then um, 
as you'll see like um, on the in the appendix of the article um, like appendix B I give kind of like the layout of like what we did from day to day and the readings that they read and um, you'll see that like for the last like four days, there were no assigned readings. And that was very intentional from the beginning because I wanted each student to, um, you know, after giving them some theoretical, you know, work to kind of chew on and play with, I wanted them to find their own readings. And so they had opportunities to go do research and find articles and things that were interesting to them. Um, and it was really important for me that they had that space to do that. And so um, when we would get together, they, they came to class having read the assigned reading for that particular day. We would break up into groups of like four or five. They would kind of debrief a little bit. And then we would, you know, get together as a larger group. We would raise questions with one another. Um, we did peer review in class to kind of reflect on some of the, you know, pieces that they were writing. Um, they gave one another feedback. And, you know, young people are really raw and critical inherently. And so they were able to support and push one another in ways that like I hadn't thought of. And so um, when it came down to the, um, the project, their final, if you will, was to, um, you know, basically come up with a metaphor using the readings that we had discussed in class. And um, it was supposed to be a reflection on their experience as either a teacher or a learner or some combination of both. And so, um, you know, I'll just uh, read a little bit of the assignment that I gave them just to make sure that like teachers know like this you can give students this kind of work and they will respond um quite effectively um if uh, you look at appendix a it says um this work is meant to be a tool for personal political and intellectual reflection about your educational and life experiences it's important and beneficial for your for you to continuously assess your personal development confront your weaknesses and acknowledge your strengths. And um, so they had to develop a metaphor to kind of tie all that together and it should compare their academic experiences to something else and consider how Paulo Freire compared his thoughts about education to banking. When you think about your experience in education as a teacher or student, what would you compare it to? And, you know, it challenges them to be compelling and, um, you know, to be really thoughtful considering what we had read leading up to that. And um, as you see in the text, uh, Sean came up with this um, metaphor called incarcerated students. And he had the, um, he had an artifact, which was a school bus with handcuffs wrapped around it. And I mean, when you see that, it's a very provocative uh, metaphor. Um, the artifact itself is very provocative. And um, when I was reading through his essay, which was, you know, an explanation of why he had developed that um, artifact, he really, you know, and, and I'm paraphrasing, really was saying that, like, you know, it wasn't just the, um, it wasn't just, like, physical incarceration and like going through scanners and um, having police officers in his building and so forth, that was the real challenge for him. He said it was the intellectual incarceration that was a major issue for him. And, you know, he was really frustrated with the fact that he had to go away to participate in a program that was independent of his school to learn, um, you know, about Freire and Kirkland and, you know, um, some of the other folks that we had read about. Um, and so he was just really, you know, taken aback by like the intellectual freedom that is possible when you're in a university setting and when you're working with like doc students and faculty who come from, you know, a variety of states and countries and things like that. And, um, 
he he really yearned for that um, in his you know public school setting, and so um, the the five you know kind of components of consequential uh, writing really came directly from him. Those were like codes from his interviews, and I include those interview excerpts um, and excerpts from his paper that really hone in on how he was conceptualizing and making sense of this experience um, in this you know, academic enrichment program and what was going on in his school. And it is worth noting that in his school, he was at the top of his class. Um, you know, he had a, a 3.6 or 7 GPA, I don't remember it's in there. Um, and, you know, he had a 32 out of 36 on the ACT. Um, you know, he was by, you know, all measures, academic measures, thriving um, in school. But for him, he realized by participating in the writing program that he was not thriving intellectually. And so even though he was able to do school really well, he realized that there was a, there was a difference between like doing school well and being challenged intellectually and being able to write in ways that are consequential as opposed to just kind of responsive to prompts. And so, you know, the prompt that I gave them is technically a prompt, but I, you know, encourage them to look within to you know engage the personal political and intellectual and to try to make sense of that and they were more in a creative and synthesis space um, using you know metaphor in its capacity beyond a literary device um, and you know in their prior uh you know in his um regular homeschool setting it was more about task completion and you know just kind of getting through and i mean he was in ap and honors classes and most of the other students were as well and they were just like what we're doing here is just vastly different from what we are doing um in these spaces where we're doing you know relatively well and um and so for me i found that to be really um problematic and um, <laughs> I've, I, you know, kind of wrote this article um, to, you know, make sure that teachers understand that even if they're teaching AP honors, you know, gifted, all these, you know, different tracks of, you know, students that um, it is still very possible that they are missing the mark in challenging those young people intellectually and in challenging and in equipping them to address issues that directly impact them. And so for him, he knew that there was something um, problematic about being in a school where it was normative to go through scanners, um, but he didn't have the language yet to put uh, you know, uh, experience, you know, he didn't quite have the language to kind of like make sense of that. And I think giving them access to like theory helped to kind of um, put some language around their experiences um, and to help them better articulate those experiences. Um, so, yeah. I think that really comes across how powerful the use of metaphor can be beyond the way we usually schoolify it mm -hmm. you know, as, a, as a as a literary device <laughs> write to include two metaphors <laughs> and one simile <laughs> you know <laughs> that's sort of um but really how powerful as a conceptual framework that can be to understand their lives and and and, and work with those and i really appreciated in the article how um it, it does come across to me, at least, um, how this is both from you and from Sean um, in helping us think, rethink practice and rethink um, indicators of learning. You have a section in there about, about that that I thought was really powerful. And I really appreciate at the end of the article, 
that you talked about possible un <laughs> uh, unintentional consequences of consequential writing. <laughs> and it got me thinking about um, how often, how so often practices that are grounded in people's experiences that come up, um, uh, that are theorized so, so richly, like the work that you've done, um, can be commodified, okay. tried to scale up, shifted from, you know, as they move from one place to another, um, the, the guts are ripped out of it. It becomes um, shallow and sometimes it can become counterproductive. Mm -hmm. um, it can start to reassert the very things that we're trying to, to shake up. Right. Um, like I could imagine, I'm hearing a lot of discourse around social emotional learning that is really reasserts, <laughs> I mean, it's really dehumanizing mm -hmm. um, that people don't have competencies or they, <laughs> or like they need work on, they need lessons in order to have social emotional learning. Uh, it's really problematic. And I could imagine mm -hmm. people's metaphors mm -hmm. for their lives being turned into like an assessment exploited right. for um, we're going to now mark these down as a weather, you know, an incarceration method uh, metaphor shows that, you know, like I could, I could imagine what Don't could all these things that could go wrong. <laughs> so I was wondering if, if you could, because <laughs> that last section um, really hit, hit on so many points, but um, I'm wondering if you could talk to us, if you've thought about this, like what are some of the ways that, this could go wrong that, that you want to make sure that people don't, <laughs> don't do like watch yourselves <laughs> for these potentials. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I wrote that section because a, I know that the vast majority of the readership of RTE, um, you know, is probably white middle-class women. Um, and so that's just, education in general, you know, it's a nationwide, you know, thing that who the vast majority of people who come through teacher education programs and so forth. Um, and I've been at three different universities and that's, that's been the vast majority. And so um, for me, I don't, and I wrestled with the notion of even including, you know, the incarcerated students, um, metaphor, you know, all the students did really powerful metaphors and, you know, I wrestled with including that or not including that because that can be taken up the wrong way. Um, people love to associate black males, high achieving or not, you know, with incarceration and there's so many problematic things that, you know, um, but I ultimately, you know, decided to include that because I wanted um, teachers to know that like they recognize when they are not getting, you know, intellectually rigorous work. Um, they know the difference between, um, you know, labels and learning. Um, and so I, I wanted that to come across. And what I want to make sure that like people don't do or that they, <laughs> don't, you know, just kind of like jack it up is with um, whenever you're dealing with um, historically marginalized populations, be them Black, be them Latinx, be them LGBTQ, um, you know, whenever you're dealing with, um, you know, populations who tend to get screwed over a lot in schools, um, there is a real danger in having students to engage in this really powerful work. Like a teacher could really take this unit up and do it in their classrooms. But if the students, you know, take it up, come up with their own really powerful metaphors and um, depending on like what they produce, I say in there that there's no way to predict what the students will come up with. Um, but, you know, if they come up with really, you know, powerful metaphors that are provocative and or critique the institutions that are schooling them, which is what Sean did, um, I am in a position where I understood 
and resonated with the critique that he was developing in this um, really powerful, you know, thesis statement that he put together. Um, but that can be taken up um, in a way by someone who is differently positioned um, and they can become like offended or taken aback by, you know, the metaphors that the students come up with. And there's a real danger in that for students to have, you know, be told that, oh, you can do like this creative intellectual work, um, but if they critique the systems that are screwing them over, um, which is more than likely to happen because a lot of the students came up with metaphors that were just kind of like, you know, alluding to the fact that they were experiencing major paradigm shifts um, and thinking about schools and learning very differently because we were giving them, they were being taught by faculty and um, leading scholars, by the way. Um, and then they also had the, you know, opportunity to go teach in a school that had Black and Latinx elementary students. And so they were able to kind of step outside of their own educational experiences in a way that they hadn't done before. Um, because they're getting poured into and then they're also pouring into young people at the same time. And so what we were talking about, they were seeing and applying and it was just kind of this really rich um, teaching and learning space. And so, um, you know, it's one thing to read about education, but when you're reading about it and applying it and then doing it and then coming back and, you know, meeting with one another and having office hours and, you know, like it was such just a very rich intellectual space. And so if you do that sort of work with the students and they produce these really powerful metaphors and then like you're offended by the critique that they develop about the institution, you can really shut students down. Um, you can, um, you know, just kind of like kill their curiosity and creativity or if they, you know, turn in something like this and then, you know, like, fortunately, I, I didn't grade these assignments um, because it was a summer enrichment program. And for me, my goal was to just maximize their teaching and learning. But the caution for, you know, teachers who are taking this up in, you know, middle school and high school ELA classrooms, they, you know, have to assess it in some sort of way and whenever you're dealing with arts and you know creativity things it's a slippery slope in how you assess art um, and I just don't ever want young people particularly young people of color to be penalized for their intellectual creativity especially when they critique institutions that often do wrong by them so. so we're so glad we're so glad to have Sam jump in and join us. So Sam, would you mind introducing yourself? And I I just want to make sure we make space for you. So <laughs> say hello. Hey, hey everyone. Uh, yeah, this is Reed, aka Sam. I teach here at the U School and we get out at four o'clock. So my students were like literally just leaving and I was literally signing in because uh, I got the short notice of the of the selection and I read it and it just resonated with me and I'm like, I'm in. And I thought it was gonna be earlier, so. I mean, I thought it was gonna be later. But anyway, I, I said, even if I could come in for 30 minutes and be with greatness, this this will be awesome. <laughs> um, like my, my, my initial read, like it was reson, the article was resonating so much with me because I have so many Sean's and I myself was probably a Sean. Mm. Um, uh, particularly like the whole metaphor of the like the glasses and yes. like let's, let's see you're rocking the glasses as well and <laughs> I, I, I love I love that and you're like you're taking that metaphor and extending it and then like the metaphor of the the, the bus and the the shackles like the school to prison pipeline like you know is the whole uh, is the whole thing like the, the critique is so real but as, as a classroom teacher, I, I will speak to like, sometimes I, I will ask my students for these metaphors or ask them for like these real critiques of schools. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult because sometimes you feel like complicit in it as well, right? And so like, 
they're critiquing the you're giving them the space to do their critique and then you kind of get i won't say beat up but you know <laughs> you, you you guys may have may have experienced that but um i, I thank you uh so much for writing this article and I'm, I'm 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 real curious to see like other folks uh you know annotate it away and chime in and like play around with metaphors and it did give me an idea of like i'm teaching a group of i teach one group of ninth graders and i teach another group of 11th graders and my ninth grade class is a little freer it's a seminar class mm -hmm. it's an elective class mm -hmm. so i have like more creative license with it and we're actually doing like these ninth grade service projects, but I'm like, what if I had them think about metaphors for these wicked problems that they're going to kind of like explore? And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm curious, and, you, and then I'll stop talking. Um, <laughs> do you have like, I mean, I, you know, I read your reference materials, but do you have like the like handouts that you use to like scaffold the metaphor? creation and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could go, I mean, they're, they're not in here, but like I could, a lot of it was, you know, generated while I was doing the work with them because I was responding to like what they needed. Um, all of the students who participated in the program, like they came from a variety of high schools. And so I didn't know who was going to show up when I, you know, on day one. And so I had all these, you know, different um, literary resources and stuff available, not knowing if and how students were going to need them, right? Um, because we didn't, um, we had like report cards and stuff, but, you know, that can tell us something and nothing at all at the same time, right? And so <laughs> um, when, when I, some of the things that I gave them, I gave them like a couple of questions to think about as they were reading along. Um, and I also, this, I mean, <laughs> one thing I did, like we always had like a PowerPoint slide that had a picture of the author because there's a difference between like writers and writing. And so um, I wanted them to see the author behind the writing um, to, uh, as a way to help them to envision themselves as writers. And so I always had like a PowerPoint slide with the author's face, um, with some, you know, basic background information about them, where they're from, what type of work they do, et cetera, et cetera. I always encourage them to, you know, Google and learn more about these people to, you know, do pre-reading activities that we would normally do in an ELA classroom. Like, why do you think they wrote this piece or what, you know, sorts of situations. Um, set up the context for this work. And so we would always do that sort of work before they actually read a piece. Um, and so when they went into the piece, they had a sense of, you know, who was writing, why they were writing and so forth. And those sorts of things helped to scaffold, you know, their reading as they went into the work. And then um, they had to write these like one page or um, critical reflections about the reading. So when they came to class the next day, that was our conversation starter, right? And so we broke up into groups and would say, okay, so what did you all discuss in your group? What did you all discuss? So I didn't have like very many like pre-made like worksheet type things, but they were more like, you know, I know people use scaffold in a variety of ways, but these are some of the very like concrete things that I did to scaffold their learning. I, again, I don't know if other folks have like asked a bunch of questions. So if I'm talking too much, tell me to tell me to be quiet. But uh, the other question I had was um, was interested in your framing around Sean, right? So Sean was this high high achieving kid, but then there's these Shans that are like not perceived as high achieving, and like where where are they at? And so I'm curious to hear like yeah. these other Shans because they're geniuses in their own rights. Right. Right. And they might not even get into your university, but like, what advice do you have for teachers that are dealing with the Sean's that are not going to even make it to your space? Yeah, I love that question. Um, <laughs> and I, I really wrestled with the language to describe the young people that I worked with. Um, 
because I didn't want people to think, well, oh, she did that with, you know, high achieving students and I just write it off as, you know, I can't do that with my kids. You don't know my kids. You know, um, <laughs> we've all had, you know, teachers with those conversations. And so um, I really think this work can be taken up with students across the spectrum. Um, and, and I hope it is like a really deep, sincere hope that students across you know, the spectrum um, have access to this type of work. Um, because really, um, I just, I believed, so there are two things that really kind of like guide my teaching um, and just like my philosophy of life. Um, like if you like love the children that you're working with, <laughs> Um, you can pretty much teach them anything. They feel the energy, um, enthusiasm that you have for like your content area and you need to know your content. And so I'm a lifelong learner. And one of the things that I hoped came through in the article was that um, I was very attentive to listening to the young people. Um, he was telling me that, oh man, this is opening up my eyes, opening up my eyes. And I kept thinking about eyes and lenses and I'm in this metaphor space. And I was like, you know, let me go to Pearl Vision down the street and like speak to an ophthalmologist and learn about like how lenses actually work. How is it that we go from seeing, like being in front of something, not being able to see it, have something put on us. And then all of a sudden this thing that was there is now available to us in a new way. And so, you know, I'm chatting it up with this ophthalmologist, I'm going back to my students and I'm, you know, speaking to them about lenses and like, you know, how we can read one text through multiple lenses and, you know, you can turn, you know, and we're engaging in theory and, you know, just like, you know, they were, they were like, oh yeah, you can, you know, you could read this through a, this kind of lens or you could read it through this lens and, you know, these are things, first of all, whether they have a 32 on the ACT or not, these students, students are already having these conversations. So to address your notion about the Shans and, you know, who would make it, you know, to, you know, the university or not, like students are already having these conversations. Um, they, um, and I don't care if they're in the regular track programs, the honors programs, they're already having these critical conversations. What I want um, teachers to do is to be able to create a space and believe that the, the young people deserve access to excellent literacy instruction. And for me, I had to push myself and read in an interdisciplinary way. Like I was reading cognitive theories, I was reading sociocultural theories, I was reading critical theories, and I was thinking about how are people conceptualizing metaphor um, across these different fields and how can I become a better learner because whenever we're learning new things you when you're teaching you have to learn things in a in a different kind of way to make sure that you can communicate it and so because I was not afraid to be in this kind of like vulnerable learning space I was able to teach them and be more attentive to what they were telling me so when he kept talking about seeing and you know eyes and opening and I was like oh let me go learn some stuff um, <laughs> from somebody else and see if I can communicate this to them and they were like yo that's dope we love that and so they were able to now have multiple examples of metaphors um, and they came up with really powerful metaphors of their own and so I really don't think it matters what their GPA is um, what their SAT or ACT scores are or what track of program they are in. I think that if teachers believe that they can do the work, love on them and give them access to the materials, that they're gonna do awesome. That's just the bottom line. So I really appreciate where, where we've, the arc of this conversation that really started with, with Andrea asking you to say more about the uh, the nature of consequential writing. And I think we've, we've come to a really awesome like jumping off point that can kick off the annotation when we think about like, um, you know, 
who deserves this type of teaching and how can the the intentional work you did with Sean inform the teaching we do with all of our students. So I'd like to invite everyone just to say a quick word of takeaway as a, as a way of thanking Sakina, because I, I really think you provided an amazing amount of depth and the passion you, you, you said that kind of drove you to want to design this metaphor work comes through in your commentary about peace. So I'm just so thankful. So if I could just invite everyone for a quick last word, I think that we're uh, at a good, good place. Well, I know I'm going to keep thinking about this idea of consequential writing. As I said, I, I want everyone to have an opportunity to engage with this themselves and with their students. And, uh, but you know, also we have a wicked problem here as you named, which is that uh, the box is very small and it's putting a lot of people outside of itself and we probably do need a bigger box. Uh, so we have a challenge here of, of the, the five aspects of consequential writing are not always supported by the systems in which we're teaching. And mm -hmm. so that will just constantly be our challenge and it is a call to action for ourselves, I, I believe a little bit. So thank you so much. Yeah, you know, can I say, uh, say something to that? Um, because the other, there were so many, <laughs> I have to say it took me, the first version of this paper was written five years ago. So I've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, and so it's gone through many revisions. And one of the things that I was thinking about in response to your comment is that I'm a teacher educator and I'm also a literacy educator. I'm an urban educator, I'm a lot of things, right? And so um, one of the things that I, want to make sure that teachers know. It, I wrote this in a way to provide teachers with tools um, to, to equip teachers, right? Because I think um, particularly in today's time where standardization is you know, very pervasive, um, I wanted to give teachers permission, if you will, to um, be creative and to let them know like how I did this, you know, work. Um, so I do a lot of, you know, work in the piece to make sure that like teachers understand my meta thinking as I work through the various aspects of the project because I wanted teachers, because I mean, you know, when you look at it, it's like, oh, okay, that makes complete sense. You know, like I get that. Like if you're a teacher, you get it when you read it and so, um, but I think oftentimes teachers don't have the time and space to think, especially when you're just kind of just trying to get through the day, you're trying to get to the bell and, you know, you have pressures from a variety of ways. And so this was my almost like a love letter to, you know, fellow ELA educators to, you know, reintroduce them to the creativity that I believe that they probably came into the field with, because I think that we too as teachers can lose our creativity and curiosity, um, you know, as we get caught in these systems that, you know, don't always support us depending on what type of school we end up at. And so I wanted to do this as like a friendly, you know, love letter or reminder like, hey, you know, you can do this thing and like, you can just stop at, you know, the grocery store or whatever, you know, on the way home and ask, you know, questions in a new way so that you can think about your content area different because I know that every ELA teacher is gonna to have to teach metaphor at some point. And so I intentionally chose that device so that you know, teachers can you know, be re-reminded or re-remember um, you know, their, their love and think about you know, their content area in a new way. I love that. That really has been my big takeaway from this conversation right now. Um, when you were talking about being a vulnerable learner um, yourself um, with with the students you were working with and and just now about that creative and critical reflexes I mean I, I you, Sam especially when you were talking about um, some, we, we can feel complicit in the systems that we're in they can numb they can make us numb just like we were talking about Sakina and and so I want to check myself I think that's the, the thing for, for myself and then also you know supporting other teachers I work with but for myself, like really check myself um, for that numbness. You know, it, it, at what point am I just getting through the day? And at what point 
um, what are some ways that I can kind of build in my own checks for, am I vulnerable? Am I being creative? Am I really being responsive? Um, am I listening? Um, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's a big takeaway for me is just to um, reconnect with the love. Yeah, because I mean, art is literally embedded in the work that we do. It's embedded yes. in us. <laughs> and so like, I didn't want teachers to like lose that. I mean, ELA teacher, we're a special breed of, you know, people, you know, like we love the arts, we love language, we love literary devices. Um, and, you know, we love connecting with young people and helping them to think about language and literacies in these, you know, unique and fun and creative ways. And our content area really does lend itself to us being, you know, the best versions of ourselves. But I think in the um, standardization, you know, kind of movement and stressors, it's very easy to forget that. And um, I wanted to create a space where we can, you know, just kind of get back to that work. And I know that when we, you know, do this work, and you know we're in this kind of vulnerable learning space that like our students will excel because then they get to see us in a different way as well and then they get to see the you know rejuvenation that we experience and when we're excited about what we're doing they get excited about it and you know they there was no way that these young people that i worked with could go back to their standardized exams and read it the same way um, they had to read differently because they now experienced education in a different way. And so like even when Sean was working with the elementary students, um, he was like, you know, I know that I have to get them past certain points, but like I feel obligated to make sure that they have similar transformational experiences that I had because learning and being smart is actually really cool. And so <laughs> Um, it, it just like, it, it created a paradigm shift for him. And so this notion, that fifth element around like leading, you know, action against inequity, you know, just kind of um, having students to kind of like rethink the way that they are thinking about learning and what constitutes learning um, and, and not just engaging in like task completion. Um, it, it just shifted everything. Um, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I get so excited when I think about um, all the, you know, just the, the different things. And I'm also that person who was a first year teacher um, in a Title I school, my first year in the classroom. And my, the school district where I taught in Houston Independent Schools um, on the south side of Houston, um, you know, when I got my list of students, um, I had, you know, loved my colleagues, but some of them, you know, looked at my list and was like, oh, you have so-and-so and so-and-so, mm, you know, you're going to be in for a challenge. And I was like, well, send them down here. I love working with the students that, you know, are, are going to be a challenge um, because there's a reason why they are a challenge. Um, oftentimes those students are like being resistant to a system that doesn't love them anyway. And so that creates space and opportunity for me to provide that love and to provide the content knowledge. Um, and for me, those two are intertwined and work together. And, you know, when, when the students have that space to just kind of like, oh, this human being actually cares about my humanity, I'm gonna like look at this content a little bit differently or I'm gonna look at it. <laughs> and so, and, and so um, you know, I was able to like publish a book with my students my first year in the classroom. Um, the book is called The Future Through My Eyes. And um, you know, I just, I have always been interested in finding ways to um, push back against the status quo and make sure that students have access to excellent literacy instruction. So, um, you know, and, you know, my students were not, um, you know, classified as like honors and AP, you know, when I was first teaching, because, you know, first year teachers don't get access to those students. But, um, <laughs> but they all did amazing work 
and they created products that they were really proud of and they appreciated that they had someone who slowed down and paid attention to them and allowed them to have a fresh start. And I always find that young people are really forgiving um, um, when, they, when they know that you love them and that you care about their intellectual capacities um, and that when you operate with a spirit of empathy and you know your content area. <laughs> That I just can't over, you know, underestimate how important it is to know your content and to also share love, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, that's, it's that's what I got. <laughs> Sorry that I'm like <laughs> going. Oh, there, there are no apologies necessary. We're so <laughs> like, we're so thankful to have you back in this project and to, you know, to really foreground your voice. And I just really appreciate your passion for this work. It's coming through in, in all your commentary. And so as we wrap up, I just know that this will help, you know, springboard some strong annotations where people will be in conversation with each other about these really important ideas. And I think that, you know, the webinar should be much longer because of the importance of your ideas. And still, I'm gonna ask for quick last thoughts from uh, Sam and Ramey, but it's so appreciative of you. Thank you. Sorry, and I have to head out. Um, I just want to just disappear. But thank you so much. And um, I can't wait to annotate with everyone. Yeah, yeah so um, no, I just want to just give thanks and like for, for this love letter. And it, my takeaway is like, um, the metaphor is um, like not only the not only the literary metaphor, but the visual metaphor and like thinking about the importance of like visual learning as well. Mm -hmm. And also, one final comment, like, I love how the article, like, humanizes and, like, pushes back against, you know, deficit, deficitizing our, our, our young people. And if, 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 no, if, if people can take that away, it, it'll be really, really powerful. Um, so, uh, again, thanks. Uh, again, even, even coming 30 minutes into this conversation was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, again, Austin, well, and Sam, my goodness, you're, you are always welcome in all of these conversations, as you certainly <laughs> know. Um, and it's always a pleasure to see you and to learn from you, um, which just leads me to say, like, I am drowning in notes now. I've got pages <laughs> and pages of notes that I've just been soaking up the wisdom of, of everyone who's been speaking and contributing and sharing in this, in this conversation, which is all really a way of saying that it's almost impossible for me to distill this down to one takeaway, although certainly a theme of trust is, is very present in the work. Um, and, and certainly it's also apparent in the conversation and just the community that we brought together over the last hour, um, you know, a sense of trust in this space that we've opened up to have uh, uh, our own type of consequential conversation and perhaps will also translate into some consequential writing maybe of our own as we move into annotation. Um, you know, the last thing I'll mention, because I'm just, it's like a whole wave has just washed over me in just the most wonderful way. And so rather than be long-winded or incoherent, I'll just simply thank you again, Sakina, on behalf of everyone who's, who's an organizer and a facilitator of, of the marginal syllabus to say that um, it's really unique to meet someone, to learn from their work, to be inspired by their scholarship and their pedagogy, and then two years later to return and to re-engage with you in this case and to just have that be as rich and as sustaining and as inspiring as this conversation has been. And I'm so eager to see where this grows um, as we move into a public phase of conversation over the coming weeks, if not coming months. And so just again, on behalf of everyone who, who's a part of this project, thank you so much for sharing so fully and openly uh, your scholarship your expertise and your love and your love letter with us. It's just been so, such a gift. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. Awesome. And so we'll wrap with just thanking our viewers for watching, watching this webinar, which is part of the Marginal Syllabus Project 2019 and 2020. This will be our March article. And so Untold Stories, Cultivating Consequential Writing with a Black Male Student Through a Critical Approach to Metaphor will be online at the start of March and accessible for participant, participant annotations at, at educatorinnovator.org. So for updates, please subscribe to our blog and sign, sign up for a monthly newsletter at educatorinnovator.org. You can follow at, at innovates underscore ed 
And please, if you're sharing about this work, use the hashtag marginal syllabus. Thanks, everybody.